I think I'm more from picking last and having been introduced the subject very, very, very recently and standing with people, for people. Speaking last, I'd like to try and by way of wrap up, bring us back to cause on why we're having these discussions. In the end of it, we should be able to develop advanced models to solve each of the current pressing needs of its nation. In the end. And one of these pressing needs is the pressure of refugees. And that's what we need to deal with. By the time the refugee convention was being passed by the United Nations in 1951, it was only three years, two, three, four years after the declaration, the UN declaration. It was about two, three years after the end of the Second World War. It was in response to displacement as had resulted from the war. A lot of people who should have been refugees had actually been killed. So they were not refugees anymore. As we speak today, and if you add the fact of internally displaced persons, which uh, Mr. Esquinto has talked about, you have the shocking statistic of 65 million people which have been given to us. If you go online, you'll find 2.6 in Middle East and North Africa, 4.3 million in Africa, 3.5 in Asia and Pacific, in Europe around 4.3, in the Americas and so on and so forth. These are not good statistics. So if you take from 1951 when this convention was passed, to date, there's been a huge increment on the number of people that are displaced. I want us to think 15 years, 20 years from today. What will be the scale of displacement of people? Internally, in their own country, and externally, in other countries. And the reason that are citing these definitions, they are running away from war, persecution, and sometimes natural disasters. Cases of persecution does not lead, do not lead to massive displacement. Cases of natural disasters. Normally do not send countries to other people to other countries. People get displaced internally. So we are left with a war. And war is something we start. War is something selfish. War is something that is now very by the time they were setting up the convention, the law of wars and things like that, you would find that 90% of the targets by the military were military installations and military targets. Today, as we speak, the reverse is true. 90% of the attacks and targets are on civilians and civilian installations. And the worst person you want to be in those situations is a woman or a child. We have reversed the statistics on the head. The focus has shifted from military war, engaging with combatants, now to engaging with innocent people. Now add the fact of terrorism. The whole thing is complicated. Now this massive displacement arises from something we can control. And it's about the responsibility of states. In around 2000, the Canadians developed something called the responsibility to protect, being the responsibility of states. I think also that this was developed from the discussion that led to the setting up of the International Criminal Court, the Rome Statute for 1989. Those discussions were there. Where a state is unable or unwilling to protect its citizens, that responsibility shifts to the world community. 
But it comes in direct confrontation with the rule on non-intervention. So when you cite Rwanda, I understand what you're saying. Non-intervention. Rwanda was unable to protect its citizens. It could have been, should have been the responsibility of the world community to get in. But they pleaded non-intervention. Domestic affairs of countries. One million people died. Bosnia is a governor. Same case. We plead convenience. And we say our mandate are no engagement. And people die. Is it time to begin exploring the possibility of reinstating the Canadian argument of the responsibility to protect being a world responsibility? Is this something Global Peace Foundation would like to pursue? It's a solid argument. Where a state is unwilling or unable to protect its own citizens, why should we plead non-intervention, non-interference, when human life is involved? Why should we? And the reasons for displacement are this. So my own take in all this discussion, is that we may need to interrogate these matters more. The presence of refugees in their millions is a manifestation of some problem. It is a result of some problem. So if you are dealing with issues of refugees, you are dealing with the symptoms of more deep-rooted problems that we have to deal with as world community. How do we go that far? The causes of what make people get displaced destroys what we are calling social cohesion. If this was a community we were living in, all of a sudden there is war. We all run our separate ways, we find ourselves in different countries. The social cohesion that we initially had is disrupted, it's destroyed. Even if we were all brought back after 10 years, all of us are brought back here, we will not be the same will not respond the same way, will not act the same way. Our responsibilities will now differ. Our languages will shift and our priorities will be different. How do you restore this? Now to people who are part of these other countries, they are no longer in their own environment. I think my colleague has explained it better. Being a practitioner, I am not. I'm not a non-profit worker. I'm an agricultural economist and a lawyer. That is what I was trained to do. But that is where we are. People all of a sudden have to get new identities, make new relationship, and from that build new frameworks of social cohesion. What do we do with this? The framework which my colleague was using to deal with issues of refugees was made in 1951 with the protocols, additional protocols that were passed in the process. Are they still valid? Don't you think that could be a place to start? Don't you think we need to review, renegotiate these issues of refugees and the convention that govern state responsibility? to stateless persons. Don't you think it's the time we initiated that discussion? That we might need to overhaul these frameworks and come up with more humane principles to deal with the new refugee crisis. And crisis is basically about our resources and response system to the problem that's in our sobbing. Because if the resources were sufficient and our responses were adequate, there would not be a crisis of refugees at all. But it's because the problem is so big that our resources and response systems are completely challenged, then it becomes a crisis. So how do we redo this whole thing? 
So my problem with this country is because first challenge. There's a time for us to review the legal, legal infrastructure on which our interventions on issues of refugees are based. Is it possible for us to look at it again? That even when we're talking about social cohesion, those issues have a framework that we can follow. What they are talking about countries blocking their borders and others opening theirs. What, within what framework? We have been reduced to regional agreements. We have been reduced to country priorities. If a country does not want refugees, it will do it its own way, without a superintending authority telling it what within the international framework will have to be done to save the situation. All of us are potential. So we should talk as if it is us, because actually it is us or people we know. And that's why it matters so much that we get the correct formula in trying to find a solution to this issue of refugees.